Suppose that a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, and an agnostic, all honest historians cognizant of first century religious movements, were locked up in the bowels of the Harvard Divinity School Library. This sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it is actually a thought experiment by John Meyer. He begins the first of his multi-volume work on the historical Jesus, asking his audience to imagine this group of learned scholars from a wide range of diverse backgrounds in worldviews and religions, trying to hammer out an agreement on who the historical Jesus was, what he said, and what he did. Mayer continues, quote, By the historical Jesus, I mean the Jesus whom we can recover, recapture, or reconstruct by using these scientific tools of modern historical research. However, let's be bolder. Instead of just a few scholars from different backgrounds, imagine all scholars alive today who are teaching in the relevant fields of ancient history, classics, and biblical studies from universities and seminaries across the world, locked up in the Harvard Divinity School Library until they can form a consensus on the facts concerning Jesus and early Christianity. Could they find agreement? The answer is yes. To illustrate how incredible this agreement among scholars is, we only need to look at the myriads on myriads of facts and stories about Jesus and early Christianity they do not agree on. The annual meeting of the Society of Biblical Literature contains the largest gathering of such scholars in the world. There are currently roughly 8,500 members from about 80 countries. These members are from a widely diverse group of backgrounds and worldviews. Jewish, Protestant, Catholic, Agnostic, Atheist, Liberal, and Conservative. And yet, the bedrock facts concerning Jesus and early Christianity have virtually unanimous consensus among the thousands of scholars who are associated with the Society of Biblical Literature and who teach and publish in the relevant fields. This is truly extraordinary. Before I get into the main argument, let me illustrate how nearly unanimous scholars are in affirming these bedrock facts by dealing with the first and f most foundational fact. Jesus existed. Establishing this bedrock fact from the outset is key, since if Jesus did not exist, he probably would not be able to do anything else in history either. That Jesus existed is virtually indisputed among scholars teaching in the relevant fields of ancient history, classics, and biblical studies. In conversation, all scholars believe Jesus existed. But in order to be precise here, quote-unquote virtually all means roughly 99%. For an analogy, it is right to say that the historical fact that roughly 6 million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust of World War II is agreed on by all scholars of history today, even if a handful of Holocaust deniers happen to be have scholarly credentials. If we are being precise, however, we must say that roughly 99% of scholars agree that the Holocaust occurred because of the existence of Holocaust deniers. If we ignore the Holocaust deniers, which I believe historians should, then it could be said that all historians agree that the Holocaust occurred during World War II. Those who deny Jesus' existence are in a similar category. Robert von Vorst says, quote, Until recently, the mainstream of New Testament scholarship has not had a large influence on research into Jesus in sources outside the New Testament. However, one long-running and often noisy side current has had such an influence. This is the controversial question, did Jesus really exist? In 
Some readers may be surprised or shocked that many books and essays, by my count, over 100, in the past 200 years, have fervently denied the very existence of Jesus. Contemporary New Testament scholars have typically viewed their arguments as so weak or bizarre that they relegate them to footnotes or often ignore them completely. Considering that there have been tens of thousands of scholars publishing books and articles about Jesus and early Christianity during the past roughly 200 years, this means that roughly 99% of scholars have consistently affirmed the historicity of Jesus of Nazareth. Additionally, we have no record of anyone denying the historicity of Jesus before roughly 200 years ago. These handful of scholars, which would be the le less than 1%, who have doubted Jesus' existence, are known as mythicists. Just as historians of World War II have to deal with or ignore Holocaust deniers, and NASA has to deal with or ignore moon landing deniers, so also biblical scholars and ancient historians have to deal with, but usually ignore, mythicists. For example, Maya dismisses G. A. Wells, who was the leading mythicist proponent in the 20th century, by saying, quote, It is significant that the Testimonium Flavanium is quickly and facilely dismissed without detailed examination by G. A. Wells and his popular and somewhat sensationalistic did, did Jesus exist? Obviously, Wells' desire to maintain the thesis that Jesus never existed demands such a treatment of Josephus, who would otherwise destroy Wells' whole argument before it could really get started. Wells' presentation descends to simple affirmation, supported not by argumentation, but by citation of generally antiquated authorities. In the case of the James passage, which is declared to be a brief marginal gloss from a Christian, which was later incorporated into the text. Wells's book, which builds its arguments on these and similar unsubstantiated claims, may be allowed to stand as a representative of a whole type of popular Jesus book that I do not bother to consider in detail. Bart Ehrman has rightly noted that virtually all mythicists identify as atheist or agnostic. Quote, it is no accident that virtually all mythicists, in fact all of them to my knowledge, are either atheists or agnostics. The ones I know anything about are quite virulently, even militantly, atheists. On the surface that may make sense. Who else would be invested in showing Jesus never existed. But when you think about it for a moment, it is not entirely logical. Whether or not Jesus existed is completely irrelevant to the question of whether God exists. So why would virulent atheists or agnostics be so invested in showing that Jesus did not exist? In 2014, at a meeting for the Freedom from Religion, Religion Foundation, Ehrman delivered an intellectual spanking to a mythicist about the historical existence of Jesus. I do not see evidence in archaeology or history for a historical Jesus. Yeah, well, I do. I mean, uh, that's why I wrote the book. Well, I mean, okay, yeah, I mean, I have a whole book on it. <laughs> I mean, uh, so th there is a lot of evidence. I mean, there, there is so much evidence that it is... It is not, I mean, I know in the, in the crowds you all run around with, it's commonly thought that Jesus did not exist. Let me tell you, once you get outside of your conclave, there's nobody who, I mean, this is not even an issue for scholars of antiquity. It is not an issue for scholars. Of, there is no scholar in any college or university in the Western world who teaches classics ancient history, New Testament, early Christianity, any related field who doubts that Jesus existed. <gasps> he elsewhere clarified the origins of mythicism. Quote, I should emphatically state the obvious. Every single source that mentions Jesus up until the 18th century assumed that he actually existed. 
That is true no matter what period you choose to examine. The Reformation, the Renaissance, the Middle Ages, late antiquity, and before. It is true of every source from our earliest periods. The 4th century, the 3rd century, the 2nd century, and the 1st century. It is true of every author of every kind, Christian, Jewish, or pagan. Most striking, it is true not just of those who came to believe in Jesus, but also of non-believers in general and of the opponents of Christianity in particular. Many scholars have found this significant. Not even the Jewish and pagan antagonists who attacked Christianity and Jesus himself entertained the thought that he never existed. This is quite clear from reading the writings of the Christian apologists, starting with such authors as the anonymous writer of the letter to Diognetus and the more famous writers Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and Origen, all from the 2nd and early 3rd centuries, all of whom defend Jesus against a number of charges, many of them scandalous. But they do not drop one hint that anyone claimed he did not exist. The same is clear from the fragments of writings that still survive from the opponents of the Christians, such as the Jew Trypho, discussed by Justin, or the pagan philosopher Celsus, cited extensively by Origen. The idea that Jesus did not exist is a modern notion. It has no ancient precedence. It was made up in the 18th century. One might well call it a modern myth, the myth of the mythical Jesus. And so with this, Ehrman concludes, quote, In any event, I need to admit that I write this book with some fear and trepidation. I know that some readers who support agnostic, atheist, or humanist causes, and who typically appreciate my other writings, will be vocal and vociferous in rejecting my historical claims. At the same time, certain readers who have found some of my other writings dangerous or threatening will be surprised, possibly even pleased, to see that, that, that here I make common cause with them. Possibly, many readers will wonder why a book is even necessary explaining that Jesus must have existed. To them, I would say that every historical person, event, or phenomenon needs to be established. The historian can take nothing for granted, and there are several loud voices out there, whether you tune in to them or not, who are declaring that Jesus is a myth. This mythicist position is interesting historically and ph phenomenologically as part of a wider skepticism that has infiltrated parts of the thinking world and that deserves a clear-headed sociological analysis in its own right. I do not have the skills or expertise to provide that wider analysis, although I will make some brief remarks about the broad mythicist phenomenon in my conclusion. In the meantime, as a historian, I can show why at least one set of skeptical claims about the past history of our civilization is almost certainly wrong. Even though these claims are seeping into the popular consciousness at an alarming rate. Jesus existed, and those vocal persons who deny it do so not because they have considered the evidence with the dispassionate eye of the historian, but because they have some other agenda that this denial serves. From a dispassionate point of view, there was a Jesus of Nazareth. To be clear, it is not the affirmation of experts that confirms the Holocaust occurred or that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon or that Jesus existed. It is the robust historical evidence and facts. Within roughly a hundred years of his death, primary sources for Jesus' existence include 1. Paul's early letters, 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Acts, and John, 3. Jewish historian Josephus, 4. Roman historians Tacitus and Suetonius, 5. Roman governor Pliny the Younger.
After more than roughly 200 years of historical and biblical criticism, the careful evaluation of such evidence for Jesus and early Christianity on the part of experts from all different backgrounds and worldviews has led to this overwhelming roughly 99% consensus, despite a handful of mythicist hecklers. In fact, it's literally a handful. In short, Jesus of Nazareth most certainly did exist. Thus, let's take the first point, in this case Paul's early letters. Over the past roughly 200 years of critical scholarship, these letters have been considered early and trustworthy sources in what they tell us about Paul and his movements, the historical Jesus, and some of his earliest followers like Peter. Seven of Paul's early letters are considered undisputed by virtually all scholars today, and these include Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. Yet, if we survey the past roughly 200 years of critical scholarship, we must narrow that undisputed list down to four main letters. And this means it's down to Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and Romans. So along with Paul's four main letters, traditions and hymns concerning the historical Jesus within these early letters, which, in other words, preeminently the creedal tradition or formula found within 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 7, give us the bedrock facts concerning Jesus' death, resurrection, appearances, and key events during the first two decades of the Christian movement. These bedrock facts and sources are indeed unalterable. Christianity's bedrock is not the inerrancy or even inspiration of the Bible. It is not any tradition, denomination, or saint. It is instead the historical man, Jesus' agonizing death on a Roman cross, and the extraordinary events and appearances that his earliest followers experienced soon after. This is the common ground where we must all, regardless, believers and non-believers, so where we must all begin our discussions when dealing with arguably the greatest questions of human history. In other words, who was Jesus? Did the historical Jesus rise from the dead? What was the cause of this world-changing movement known as Christianity? And how do you fit into the story of Jesus? Thus, answering these questions start with studying the historical meetings of the apostles. For example, one of the most recent epic meetings of saints was between the myth-making giants C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. And they met weekly at a pub in Oxford discussing Narnia, Middle-earth, Norse myths, and ultimately how Christianity is the true myth. But in the early history of Christianity, there was a meeting that was even more important than the meeting of Lewis and Tolkien. It happened when the great apostles Peter and Paul spent a fortnight together in Jerusalem. This is not legend, but real history. Thus, Peter and Paul are almost certainly the two most influential figures in the history of Christianity, with Jesus as their rock and foundation. And there they were, walking the streets of Jerusalem together, conversing, praying, and sharing their hearts. An epic meeting indeed. What were the first words shared between Peter and Paul when they met? What did they talk about as they spent day and night together during those two weeks? What sights did they see? Who else joined them in their journeys? We do not know. History is silent. But what we do know, what is a bedrock fact, is that they did meet together for two weeks. Scholars are unanimous that this meeting took place in Jerusalem. Even if we don't know the content of the conversation or even the exact year of the meeting. It was within roughly five years of Jesus' crucifixion 
so in this case between 33 AD and 38 AD. There is also unanimous agreement that Paul is telling the truth when he s says he was Peter's house guest for roughly 15 days in Galatians 1 verse 18. This is one of a handful of chronological markers Paul gives in his letters, especially in Galatians. In the same verse, he mentions three years later. And the next chapter begins, quote, then 14 years later. In addition, Paul uses the strongest language to say he is telling the truth. So in Galatians 1.20, he says, Before God, what I'm writing to you is the truth. Paul makes it clear to the Galatians that these events really happened. In fact, roughly 2,000 years later, critical scholars of all stripes, whether non-believers and believers alike, all agree. Thus, the roughly two weeks is a long time to spend with someone, especially without the distractions of movies, television, or social media. They must have really bonded as fellow followers of Jesus and peered deep within each other's hearts. How could they not have become lifelong friends after this time? Chrysostom, 4th century bishop of Constantinople, says, Now to remain with him was an act of honor, but to remain with him so many days was one of friendship and extreme love. They were close enough friends, as we read later in Galatians 2 verses 11 to 14, for Paul to feel comfortable enough to publicly rebuke Peter when he was not acting in line with the gospel. Let us visualize both men offering each other the right hand of fellowship and embracing in that first meeting. If this meeting took place in 37 AD, Peter would have been in his early 40s and Paul in his late 20s they must have both referred to the other with that uniquely Christian greeting brother. Where did they go? Did Peter take Paul fishing? Did they pray at the temple? Did they travel around Jerusalem and visit the places where Jesus was arrested, put on trial, and crucified? If so, this would have been the first Christian pilgrimage to the holy sites of Jerusalem. And the tour guide was Peter himself. Or maybe Peter took Paul to the courtyard where he denied Jesus three times. Maybe he told him the dark story in much the same way we find it in Mark's Gospel. It is a bedrock fact that these titans met, but exactly what they discussed and where they went is left to the historical imagination. While we don't know exactly what they said to each other, there is one significant clue as to the content of their talks. Paul says, quote, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas. This phrase, become acquainted, is from the Greek historio. It is where we get the English word history. It is found nowhere else in the New Testament. What historical information would Paul want to learn from Peter? They surely did not spend all their time talking about the athletic games or the weather. It is unimaginable that the primary content of their conversations did, um, did not involve the historical man Jesus. J. Lewis Martin says, quote, It is, of course, inconceivable that during the visit Cephas was silent about Jesus the Christ, about God's having raised him from the dead and about the work among his fellow Jews to which God had called him. Moreover, we can easily imagine that when the teachers gave the Galatians their own com comments on Paul's letter, they cited this visit as one of the occasions on which Paul was sure to have received instruction from Peter. If, however, he received from Cephas information about Jesus, he clearly did not consider that to be instruction in, quote-unquote, the gospel. Thus, it is important to point out that Paul did not learn the gospel from Peter, as Paul forcefully argues, quote, For I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin. For I did not receive it from a man, nor was I taught it, 
but it was revealed to me by Jesus the Messiah. This occurred during his conversion roughly three years earlier. Thus, Ehrman writes, quote, Paul did not see himself as switching religions. He came to realize that Christ was the fulfillment of Judaism, of everything that God had planned and revealed within the sacred Jewish scriptures. God had not abandoned the Jews or vacated the Jewish religion. Christ himself had not opposed the Jewish faith or proposed to start something new. Christ stood in absolute continuity with all that went before. On the other hand, Paul did learn many historical facts and traditions about Jesus from Peter and others who knew the historical Jesus. This awareness of Jesus' life, exemplary character, and teachings is reflected all throughout his letters. As you can see in this list here, ranging from 1 Corinthians 7 all the way through 2 Corinthians 8, Galatians 1 and 4, Romans 14 and 15, Philippians 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, and 1 Timothy 6. From Galatians alone, we know that on the same visit, when he spent 15 days with Peter, Paul spent some time with James, who is Jesus' brother. During his, vis his second visit to Jerusalem in 46 to 47 AD, Paul met John, the son of Zebedee, and possibly others of the Twelve. There, the proposed authors of 21 books of the New Testament, out of 27 books total, were together deciding the future of Jesus' church. So in other words, Paul represents 13 letters, Peter represents two letters, James is one letter, and John, who composed one gospel, three letters, and Revelation. Other than Paul's undisputed seven letters, the authorship of the rest of the New Testament books is debated among scholars. Regardless of what they discussed, the fact that the chief apostles behind most of the New Testament met in the mid-40s AD to make significant decisions regarding the future of the church is remarkable. In other words, those same hands that once embraced the historical Jesus were now embracing Paul. It is very likely that this was the meeting where Paul received the creedal traditions he cites in 1 Corinthians 15, among other traditions and hymns concerning the historical Jesus. These creedal traditions were pre-Pauline, composed in the form of a creed, whether oral or written. Scholars are unanimous that these creedal traditions originated at the latest within roughly 10 years of Jesus' death and, at the earliest, months after Jesus' death. This is why we begin with this bedrock meeting between Peter and Paul. F. F. Bruce says, quote, one piece of information which he most probably received during his visit was that Jesus, having been raised from the dead on the third day, appeared to Cephas. That Jesus in resurrection appeared personally to Simon Peter is attested independently in Luke 24.34 and may be implied elsewhere in the resurrection narratives of the Gospels. It may also have been from Cephas that Paul learned how, after his appearance to Cephas, Jesus appeared then to the twelve, then to more than 500 brethren at one time. The further statement at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 verse 6, that most of these brethren were still alive in Paul, is Paul's addition, 20 years after he originally received the information. As evidenced throughout his letters, Paul learned many historical facts and traditions about Jesus from Peter, James, and others who knew the historical Jesus. Yet, the creedal tradition in 1 Corinthians 15 is the most valuable of them all. And so thus, Ehrman writes, quote, What is striking is that Paul indicates that this statement of faith is something he already had taught the Christians in Corinth, presumably when he converted them. And so it must go back to the founding of the community,
possibly four or five years earlier. Moreover, and this is the important part, Paul indicates that he did not devise the statement himself, but that he, quote-unquote, received it from others. Paul uses this kind of language elsewhere in 1 Corinthians, and it is believed far and wide among New Testament specialists that Paul is indicating that this is a tradition already widespread in the Christian church, handed over to him by Christian teachers, possibly even the earliest apostles themselves. In other words, this is what New Testament scholars call a pre-Pauline tradition, one that was in circulation before Paul wrote it, and even before he gave it to the Corinthians when he first persuaded them to become followers of Jesus. So this is a very ancient tradition about Jesus. Does it go back even to before the time when Paul himself joined the movement around the year 33 CE, some three years after Jesus had died? If so, it would be very ancient indeed. If Paul received this creedal tradition sometime in the mid-30s AD, then it must have been composed sometime before he received it, and of course, after Jesus was crucified in 33 AD. This is what leads to the agreement among scholars that this creedal tradition should be dated no later than a decade after Jesus' crucifixion. Some scholars even date its composition to within months of Jesus' death, going back to the very pillars themselves, which would mean this, this would mean Peter, James, who is Jesus' brother, John, and possibly others of the Twelve. Dale Allison writes, quote, This overview of foundational events has its close sequential parallel in Acts 13, verses 20 to 31, and incorporates, as almost universally recognized, a pre-Pauline formula. Not only does Paul plainly say this, but he also uses words and expressions here that he does not use elsewhere. For example, sins in the plural, or according to the scriptures, and was raised in the perfect instead of the aorist. He was seen or appeared, and the twelve. There has been much debate over the extent of the tradition before Paul. Verses 6 and 8 must be the apostles' own additions. But what else is secondary? Or what if anything Paul has subtracted? Or what stages the complex passed through before it reached Paul? We do not know. We also do not know whether any part of the unit goes back to a Semitic original, as Joachim Jeremiah urged, or whether Hans Konzelman was right to deny this. The one thing we can be assured of is that, quote, since Paul has visited Peter and the Christian community in Jerusalem about five, six years after the crucifixion of Jesus, the tradition which he reports can, at least, not contradict what he heard then. Indeed, Paul knew Peter and James and presumably others who claimed to have seen the risen Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 8 is not folklore. Thus, let us behold the bedrock, which is the most ancient source of Christianity, unanimously dated within roughly five years of Jesus' death. And this is the creed that we see in 1 Corinthians 15. The Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried, he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and is still alive. And he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Next, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and finally, he was seen by me, as though I were born abnormally late. Even though we do not 
know everything about this meeting between Peter and Paul that we would like. The fruit of this meeting, represented in Paul's receiving some or all of the, tr the traditions behind 1 Corinthians 15, forms the unalterable bedrock source of Christianity.